The chamber would like to give the floor to the prosecution to respond to an article in the Phnom Penh Post that has been submitted by the prosecution to the trial chamber through email. You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning, Your Honours. As the President just indicated, we did a short while ago um, forward this particular letter to the editor of Phnom Penh Post to all parties. Uh, Your Honours, we asked for time to uh, make submissions in relation to this, to this letter. Uh, it was published this morning in the Phnom Penh Post, so the edition of the 18th of July, on page 16. It is a letter entitled, Q Sam Pan is forced to remain silent. It's signed by, or issued in the name of, Anta Gese Kong Sam On and Arthur Verkin, counsel for Q Sam Pan. The reason we made this application to be heard, Your Honours, uh, is both in light of the fact that we are uh, approaching the conclusion of evidence, but also in light of the scandalous nature of the allegations made uh, in, in a public uh, fashion, and our view that allegations of this sort must not only not be tolerated by this court, but should also be addressed and dealt with uh, in accordance with law and in accordance with accepted standards of ethics. It's a rather long list of uh, allegations that this letter contains, and I will try to deal with all of them um, one by one. Uh, and of course, I'm at Your Honour's disposal uh, if you wish to hear from us further. But our application will be uh, pursuant to Rule 35 that counsel be formally rebuked and that a formal reprimand be issued and further measures be taken against them in light of what in our submission is a clear attempt to interfere with the administration of justice and conduct that, fa that falls far below, far below the ethical and professional standards that counsel are required and expected to uphold in this courtroom and before your honours. I'll deal with the allegations one by one, because I do believe, on behalf of the Office of the Co-Prosecutors, it is important to set the record straight at the earliest possible opportunity. So the first allegation that is made in this letter is that Your Honours have heard dozens of witnesses and admitted as evidence thousands of documents, while ignoring many concerns expressed by the defence. This is a clear misrepresentation of the record of these proceedings. At every turn, the defence have been given an opportunity to challenge prosecutions and indeed civil parties' documentary evidence, as well as being given an opportunity to submit their own documentary material. Of course, at every turn, they have availed themselves of those opportunities, as have we. By way of a very brief recap, in this court we had witnesses who testified to the origin and provenance of documentary evidence, two witnesses from DCCAM. We had extensive hearings on each of the annexes that the prosecution put forward. The defence were able to make written and oral submissions on all of those documents. As to the allegations that somehow defence concerns were ignored, this is clearly false. Reasoned decisions were issued in relation to every annex, as well as separately in relation to witness statements, which were the subject of further submissions yesterday. There can be no credible allegation that anyone has been prevented an opportunity or that anyone's concerns have not been considered. It is one thing to disagree with the decision, following which, of course, counsel have the possibility of which they've been reminded on numerous occasions by your honours of appealing to the Supreme Court. That is one thing. But to make false allegations about effectively being gagged, ignored 
or prevented from making submissions is unreasonable, it is, it is unethical, it is unprofessional. Further on Defence's concerns with documents, I would remind the Defence that on numerous occasions where we've made applications for new material to be admitted, they were permitted to make written and oral submissions, and in fact, Your Honours declined our request to admit a number of documents. Among them, a series of documents from Amnesty International, US cables predating the April 1975 period, and new witness statements, such as the statement of witness Mayor Swan, who of course testified before Your Honours in October 2012. The second allegation, and I will slow down. I will repeat the name of that witness for the record, witness Maus Vaughan. The second allegation relates to an alleged denial by your honours of a possibility of, quote, a real discussion on the mountain of evidence admitted. One wonders when reading these words whether counsel for Kusampan are operating in a parallel reality. Only recently, on the 9th of July, having sought an opportunity to make presentations on key evidence, they failed to do so. I stood at that juncture and asked your honours to consider giving counsel extra time. And your honours did so. Both the President and Judge Laverne addressed Counsel Verkin, asking him on several occasions whether he intended to make presentations on key documents and whether he intended to avail himself of the opportunity given to him by your honours to respond to the key documents, the mountain as they describe it, that the prosecution has put forward. He declined that opportunity. He declined that opportunity and this morning he seeks to mislead the public and everyone else observing these proceedings as to what happened here in court. To mislead the public as to their own sloppiness and as to their own failure to take the opportunities given to them, including opportunities specifically offered to them for extra time to make submissions on documents. To make this claim is simply outrageous against that record. The third complaint relates to the severance order. And it is always amusing to see that the defence now take issue with the severance order, having in fact supported it throughout this trial. And this is what they say. Quote, while hindering the defence from discussing the evidence presented in the course of the first trial, allegedly devoted to the policy evacuation, the Chamber surprisingly announced it would adjudicate within the realm of the first trial the responsibility of Q Sampan with regard to all criminal policies. They go on to say that this is indeed shocking, their words. As a matter of record, the scope of this trial was defined in the severance order in September 2011. Counsel for Q Sampan did not question that decision, nor did they seek its re reconsideration. In fact, they opposed the prosecution's appeal to have the scope of trial revisited. And here, I will refer to their response to our appeal because I, I believe it is important to put on the record, again, just what the defence's position has been throughout this trial. In their response to the co-prosecutor's immediate appeal of the severance order, document E163-5-1, at paragraph 31, Council make it clear 
that they in fact fully understand the scope of the severance order and the scope of the trial. Quote, however, the trial chamber did not issue the severance order with a view to summarizing the indictment, but rather to permitting a detailed review of all its components. As the trial chamber has previously explained in issuing the severance order, its reasons were, going to number two, to ensure that the first trial encompasses a thorough examination of the fundamental issues and allegations against all accused. And three, to provide a foundation for a more detailed examination of the remaining charges and factual allegations against the accused in later trials. The defence then go on to argue that, in fact, this is a decision that was perfectly reasoned and fully understood by them. Paragraph 46. The defence does not agree with the arguments that the trial chamber failed to provide adequate reasons. Paragraph 49, second sentence. The truth is that contrary to the co-prosecutor's assertion, the trial chamber clearly gave adequate reasons for its decision by taking into account the risk involved in extending the scope of case 002. An almost unbelievable exercise in hypocrisy. Having supported the order throughout this trial, having failed to raise any issues in relation to the scope of the trial, having opposed, in fact, appeals on this issue, they now turn around and say that you have placed them in a state of confusion and that, that they have not been able to effectively engage and defend their client in relation to these policies. The further allegation is that, and this is the fourth allegation in the letter, that the dice is loaded, that the chamber has never been interested in hearing what the defence has to say. Again, an outrageous and false claim. Just a couple of aspects of this trial for everyone's benefit. They have been given an equal time to question all witnesses. They were given opportunities to propose their own witnesses, and they did, and the chamber called those witnesses. They were given opportunities to make document presentations, they declined them. In fact, they've, no, they've made no complaints about any substantive aspect of this trial until this very last minute change of heart by Q Sampan. And it is important to recall that it was as recently as the 27th of May against that entire trial record that Q Sampan confirmed he intended to continue testifying as recently as the 27th of May, when he made that confirmation, no issues were raised about supposed allegations of fair trial rights. No issues were raised about an inability to put their case forward. They made the strategic decision, and that is their right. And in our submissions, it does draw certain implications for them, but it does not entitle them to misrepresent the record as they have sought to do. And, final, and the final misrepresentation in this open letter relates to the circumstances leading up to Q Sampan's refusal to continue testifying. The allegation here is that the Chamber has denied all of Q Sampan's requests in relation to the mode of his examination. Again, not true. Your Honours initially accepted some of the proposals and denied others, which in our submission is an entirely reasonable decision, a decision consistent with every case ever prosecuted at any international tribunal. But having made those initial accommodations, and having then heard that Q Sampan was refusing 
to continue to testify, Your Honours gave us an opportunity to offer further accommodation. Contrary to the article, those accommodations did not relate only to extra time to prepare. We also offered to give Q Sampan a list of topics on which he would be examined. None of that information appears in this article. None of that information is shared with the public as Q Sampan seek to put forward this series of misrepresentations about supposed breaches of rights. And that brings me to my conclusion and, and our application. It is our respectful submission that by issuing this false and misleading statement in relation to ongoing proceedings before your honours, council have engaged in a blatant attempt to interfere with the administration of justice and to bring the administration of justice into disrepute. This falls far short of the standards of ethics, professionalism and integrity that are required of council. If I can refer to just one document that is relevant for present purposes, and it is the UN resolution on the basic principles on the role of lawyers. It's a United Nations document. It applies to everyone in this courtroom. The document number is UN Doc A stroke CONF dot one four four dot two eight slash rev.1 In fact, one shouldn't have to read this in a court of law with professional counsel, but we will read it because it's important to remind them of the duties they have failed to fulfill. Article 12, quote, lawyers shall at, shall at all times maintain the honour and dignity of their profession as essential agents of the administration of justice. Article 14, lawyers in protecting the rights of their clients shall at all times act freely and diligently in accordance with the law and recognised standards and ethics of the legal profession. Pursuant to Article 23, those same standards of ethics apply when counsel engage in public activities such as discussing the administration of justice in newspapers. Your Honours, this article contains outrageous misrepresentations of fact. It is a cynical, calculated attempt to mislead the public as I said, to bring the proceedings before the court into disrepute and to make allegations, false allegations, in relation to a matter, specifically the matter of adverse inferences, which is presently under consideration by your honours. It is indeed an appalling failure to act professionally and ethically and as such it should be sanctioned so that a strong message can be sent by this court that this is not permissible behaviour and that it will not be tolerated. We apply pursuant to Rule 35 to your honours to issue a formal reprimand or rebuke to counsel Kong Sam On, Anta Gisei and Arthur Verkin to refer them to their respective bar associations to notify the defence support section of this matter and of course to issue that reprimand and that reference as public documents so that the public record can be corrected and these outrageous misrepresentations put to rest. That is our application, Your Honours. And if there are any further questions that you wish me to address, I'm at your disposal. The President, thank you, Mr. Prosecutor. Madam Lead Co Lawyer for the Civil Party, you may proceed.
Yes, Mr. President, uh, thank you for this opportunity to take a few minutes of your time because I wish to react uh, to this uh, column or editorial that seems to me to be particularly serious and very clearly speaking is something that is false and something that is disloyal. I wish first to make a few introductory remarks. The first is that when we don't wish to speak, it's always easier to justify one side, oneself by saying that we are prevented and that we're forced to, to remain silent by someone else. And that's exactly what is happening here. And my second remark is that I infinitely regret the form that was chosen by the Que Sans Pan defense to voice their opinion in that way. We had a debate on the same topic f here, f and since the chamber did not to support the defense, the defense is turning to a newspaper which I don't believe is an appropriate place for an adversarial debate. And he, in this paper, we don't have to justify everything point by point. And it's also a place where it's possible to misrepresent what is happening. And this is what's happening here. I think that this article is an insult to the chamber. Beyond this chamber, it's also an insult for our proceedings that we've been having for the past two years. And beyond this, it is an insult to the civil parties we are representing here, and an insult to the Cambodian people, and this should be reminded. Of course, I support the co-prosecution here regarding all of the allegations made by the Kyrgyzstan defense. I share the prosecution's point of view each one of these allegations is false, not grounded. It was already evoked here, and it was already rejected by this chamber. I wish simply to add two small comments regarding two particular allegations. Regarding the documentary mass that we're facing here, I am asking myself what the could have Kusampa defense was expecting by coming to such a trial. Are civil law lawyers surprised by the uh, civil parties here who have joined? I hope not. Are, is the Kusampa defense surprised by the number of documents? Well, I believe that the more documents we have, the more impartial we can be. If the if Nunchia or Kyosampan would be prosecuted on the base of five documents, then there would be a problem of impartiality, of partiality and justice. Now, my second uh, comment on regarding the allegations regarding the five policies. In this article, I read that your chamber is accused of having suddenly introduced at the very end of this trial the discussion on these five policies. This is false. As of your severance order, you mentioned the paragraphs regarding the existence of these policies. And often, you insisted during the proceedings on this to remind us that we were going to discuss the existence of these five policies. So this assertion is blatantly false among the other false assertions. I believe that what the the Kyrgyzstan defense team is doing today is nothing else than an attempt to try to withhold the chamber of its credibility at the very end of these proceedings. It is nothing else than a strategy. The reality, which I wish to remind, is as of the very first days of this trial, I remember that Nunchia and Kyosampan promised
and Mr. Kusompa in particular insisted that he would, and he said to us that he would speak at the end of the trial. He said it, and he promised it not so much to the chamber, but to the civil parties and to the Cambodian people. In any case, that, those were the words he used back then. And he had many opportunities to do so, and your chamber offered him the opportunities for him to do so, as well as to his counsel. I was maybe a little less flexible. I believe a trial is not simply a moment when we consider legal, abstract legal issues. It's not something only for jurists and specialists. It's, all, it's something that is for society at large, for the Cambodian people, for the international community, and for the victims, for the civil parties, for the civil parties representing here all of the victims. And I believe that today, this encounter that we have, which Nunchia and Kusampan are refusing, that is their choice. But what I find particularly dishonest is that cho that choice that they made today, they are trying to have the chamber bear the responsibility for this choice, but not by themselves. I have no specific position on the sanction requested, and this the chamber, of course, will assess. But what I want, however, to underline today is the seriousness of what's indicated in this article, which was brought to us little by little over the past weeks and over the past days. I believe that the accusations here against your chamber are an insult against you and also an insult against the civil parties and against all peop everybody coming here every day to find out what has happened, to hear what has happened, and to understand what has happened. And I wish to stress how serious the matter is. Thank you. President, thank you. The national lead call lawyer for the Civil Party, you may proceed. Council Peyong. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, Your Honours. I have a few additional points to my esteemed uh, colleague from the prosecution and my international lead co-lawyer for the civil party, but I do not um, comment on the legal aspect, but I speak on behalf of the uh, civil parties. I would like to assert uh, to the chamber concerning the uh, expectation of the civil party uh, from the accused. Uh, at the very uh, beginning, particularly during the investigation stage, the co-accused once decided to exercise their right to remain silent. Uh, they did not respond to the question by the co-investigating judges. And this move uh, aroused uh, uh, suspicion by the uh, civil party as to why they decided uh, to do so. But then at the start of the uh, trial by this chamber, the co-accused, particularly Mr. Nguyen Chia and Mr. Kiu Sampon, uh, started to respond to the question by the prosecutors. And this move uh, made uh, the, the civil party um, find uh, that uh, it is uh, important uh, that the uh, co-accused uh, respond to the question because they want the co-accused uh, to respond to the question. They have asked us as their representative why the accused uh, refused to respond to the question. How can we ascertain the truth without the response uh, from the uh, co-accused? So as the lawyers for the civil parties, we uh, from time to time have to respond to the query by the uh, civil parties. Following the death of Mr. Ian Sari in last March, uh, certain uh, civil parties have made a request 
uh, to the lead co-lawyer for the civil party, and they have made a public appeal as well that the uh, co-accused uh, should respond to the question, and they should enlighten the court, and they should understand that their testimony, their response to the question, are very important to them. Now, the we haven't met all the civil parties, but I am sure that uh, their reason move will make the civil party uh, most unhappy. I have uh, not much uh, thing to add, but on behalf of the civil party, I still earnestly request uh, that the co-accused uh, be required to respond to the uh, question uh, that will help the civil uh, uh, help appease the civil party, and in addition, it is also useful for the historical record uh, for the younger generation to come to learn about their past history. Thank you, Mr. President. The President, thank you. The hearing of the testimony of witness Stephen Hedder has come to an end, and the Chamber notes uh, the application by the co lawyer uh, by the co prosecutor and the observation by the lead co lawyer for the civil party concerning a an article published on the Phnom Penh Post today. The President, the defense team for Mr. Kiu Sampon, do you have uh, any uh, observation or response uh, to make uh, to the application uh, put forth by the prosecution? Since I did not uh, see that you intended uh, to make this observation, I did not uh, grant you the floor earlier. But if you do have any observation, uh, you may proceed, counsel. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, indeed. I wish to make a few observations. The first, as a defense counsel, we never intended to insult anyone, nor the chamber, nor the parties, and even less the civil parties, and even less so the Cambodian people. That's my first observation. My second, as a defense counsel, our role is to represent our client, to assist him, and to carry his voice. There is nothing in this article published by the Phnom Penh Post, absolutely nothing that does not already exist in the arguments we developed before the chamber. Whether it be, and let me give you the references here, our findings relative to the questioning of the accused, at E288-4, everything here that we are developing uh, in our submission can be found in summarized form in this article. Everything that we have said regarding severance, regarding issues around this, we have already stated it before this chamber when we 
examined, and I can say so because I am the one that raised these objections and I was the one who raised these problems during the document hearing on joint criminal enterprise. Let me start with this point because it's an important point and I find it absolutely scandalous today that we're being criticized for having understood what was written in our decisions and we did not appeal a decision which seemed clear based on the elements we gathered from the chamber and today we're telling us that we are changing our position. We developed our argumentation in an extremely in-depth way. I was the one at that hearing, so I can say so with quite a bit of certainty. When the documents were presented on the modes of liability linked with JCE. And what did I say then? I said that we had understood in the Cusson defense that, and we said that we would refer to Annex E 124 slash 7.3, which explains to the parties, which specified to the parties what the scope was of the elements discussed here in case 002-1. And now I would like to refer you to this document. It was in paragraph 5 of this annex. And this paragraph 5 of this annex explains that in this trial 00201, the forms of liability would be examined. A. Liability related to the participation in a joint criminal enterprise, paragraph 1521 to 1525, except for anything regarding the grave violations of the Geneva Conventions and the subparagraphs titled the creation and the operation of the work cooperatives, the re-education of bad elements, as well as the elim elimination of enemies within and outside of the party and the regulation of mar marriage. And we would only focus on the soldiers and officials of the Khmer Republic. Now, regarding subparagraph headed called special measures against specific groups, in particular the Cham, the Vietnamese, Buddhists, and uh, of former officials and servicemen and their <coughs> families. It is on the base of this annex, and I did not invent it, this is an annex that was uh, drafted at the same time as the severance order of the chamber to explain what was going to be the scope that would be under consideration. We explained during uh, this hearing on joint criminal enterprise relative to modes of liability that under these conditions we cannot understand that the other policies, whereas they had been excluded specifically from this annex, be considered now. That's the first point to explain why it is at that moment that the defense raised the issue and uh, it was even more so important because later on the co-prosecutors as well as the civil party lawyers explained to you that it was not possible to simply speak about the existence but we also had to speak about the implementation of these policies and this gave rise to a very important legal issue which we uh, <coughs> underlined and this is nothing new. M maybe I should slow down. Uh, it's true that I'm uh, of course I'm a bit uh, worked up, so maybe, well, uh, regarding severance, um, this is what was said, and I remember very, very clearly having said that if we hadn't appealed uh, the severance order the first time, nor the second time when the chamber issued a recent decision, if we didn't uh, appeal this, it was in light of this particular point because we thought that things that we had to talk about were very clear. That's the first point. The second point, and this is nothing new, this is not the first time that we're saying this, we have kept on saying this since the beginning of this trial, as of when we started speaking about uh, uh, the preparation of the final submissions and the way that we were going to deal with the documentary mass. Uh, uh, so I would like to reassure my civil party colleague we were, of course, expecting a lot of documents in this trial, but since there are many, many documents, we were also expecting to have the possibility at the end of these proceedings, as happens in all and every trial, to confront the evidence, whether it be testimony, whether it be documentary evidence. We were hoping that 
we could bring up in detail every point and to shed light uh, on these points for the chamber. The 100 pages granted to us for our final submission do not allow us to have this full, a, full, a full debate, which is necessary and uh, which is necessary at the end of the trial. It's not the first time we said it. We already we said it before. And what we said in this Plum Pen Post article can be found uh, in our submissions E288-4, can be found when you look at the written records, uh, when you look at the transcripts of the um, hearings. It can also be found in our different observations. I remember also uh, the f trial management meeting, the first one, that in the number of pages granted to us, if you cannot take into consideration that we have never heard until now the defense's position, these 100 pages will correspond to nothing because the prosecutor, has, who has 200 pages, and we like to remind us, that he had he has had the number of pages maintained, and we are stuck with 100 pages, whereas Ying Sari is no longer with us. That's just a side point. We stressed at that point that the prosecutor had already an introductory submission which corresponds to an, un uh, 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 an unlimited amount of pages, which states his case. So this is not the case for the defense. So telling us that... or. or uh, and we have already told you that only having 100 pages for our final statement is not acceptable. The difference is that what we said in our submission, we also said in this newspaper article. And I'd like to remind you that the submission is public. Uh, maybe our position does not suit the, the coast prosecution or the chamber or the civil parties, but still, the positions that we have as... Defense counsel, of course, are not there to please everyone. Our aim is to defend our clients and uh, to present our defense. Maybe you like it, maybe you don't like it. It's a pity, but that's the case in a trial. The analysis that uh, we have of uh, the case is not the same analysis as the co-prosecution. It's not the same, of course, as the civil party lawyers. And this is why we have a trial. This is why we are confronting each other. This is why we are confronting our different points of view. The only difference that we have today is that we have already presented what was already presented in the submission I'm speaking to you about, and by Kusumpa when he spoke, and by Arthur Verken, or by myself, or Kong Sam Un, all of this was already said in, during the hearing uh, when, of course, our microphones were not disactivated. Things were said and said again, and things that we said again publicly as uh, we had already filed our submission publicly, E288-4, so there's nothing new. So, of course, if you have to sanction us because we present our position, because we express our opinion as defense counsel, well, then, yes, of course, I'd like to refer you to uh, the basic principles of uh, the bar adopted by the Eighth Council for the Prevention of Crimes uh, uh, held in Havana on 27 August to 7 September 1990, the basic principles relative uh, of... of uh, uh, the UNHCHR specifying th the basic principles relative to the role of the bar specify in paragraph 23 freedom of expression and of association that lawyers as anyone else in a trial must enjoy freedom of expression and, and we have this freedom of expression and we have used it by all means through our submissions through our microphones when it was possible, and through the press. So there is absolutely nothing new. Absolutely nothing new. Everything we said to the press, we already said before this chamber. We have already written it. So today, I don't know why. Well, I suppose I know why, but, well, the co-prosecutors want to turn this into a drastic event. There's no reason for this. We have expressed our position, and we explain our position. That is part of our 
educational strategy, you may call it strategy, but the position, our position n means that I am the right, I have the right to say why my client takes and takes such a position. And I am allowed to say so during the hearing, publicly through the press, everything that we denounced in the press, we had already denounced them before this chamber. If this must lead to sanctions, well, I think then we have reached a, a very a difficult juncture and it will be really regrettable. Of course, you have the co-prosecutor submission, you have the defense's positions, which are not new, and are always rest on either decisions by the, the chamber or on discussions during the document hearing and like to refer to all of the detailed uh, submissions of Arthur Reckon when he was explaining why we would not participate in a document hearing. So once again, there is nothing new, nothing new, except that this time, yes, maybe this hearing is a bit more important than or was important uh, than today. This trial is public. Anyone who wishes to check the transcript of this trial might be able to see what Kusson-Pont's position was, what were the arguments that were presented, and may notice that nothing new, nothing, absolutely nothing new has been developed in this article, except for the fact that, of course, this position is stated in a newspaper. If that's a problem, I regret it. But once again, the hearings are public, our position is public, and as um, the a defense counsel, we can explain why we have the right to explain why we take such and such a position. Whether people believe that our position is not a right one, is erroneous, that is their right, as well as it is Cusson-Pont's right in his position as an accused before your chamber to also react uh, within the limits of his possibilities and explain how he was reacting to this fact. So there's nothing new. There's no reason to sanction anyone except considering maybe that we are stand-in lawyers who can say nothing uh, when they don't understand something, when they feel that something is unfair. We have explained often why we believe that the page limit is unfair, why we believe that we cannot discuss all of the evidence because of the limit of pages, why this is unfair, and we explained why it is unfair to cut off a microphone because we were expressing maybe certain ideas that did not agree with the prosecution or, or with the chamber. But the, the idea, once again, in a trial, in a criminal trial, it's to have confrontation, confrontation of visions, confrontations of positions, and you, the bench, will make the decision at the end, and of course, we won't have other, any other choice than to consider your uh, p uh, decision based on the elements that we have provided to these proceedings. So what we said in this article is nothing different from what we said before. Well, if this deserves a sanction, well, this is really regrettable in regard to the defense's rights and extremely regrettable in regard to the confrontation of different points of views in consideration of the legal and factual elements of this trial. The President, Mr. Kung Sumon, you may proceed. Council Kung Sumon, thank you, Mr. President. I know that um, we are now 10 minutes over the time, but I would like to have a brief uh, observation uh, concerning the application by the uh, co-prosecutor and uh, that of the lead co-lawyers for the civil parties. Overall, I believe uh, that uh, the application by the prosecutor was done in a uh, uh, hash, uh, uh, in a uh, hazel, and I believe that the application uh, to the chamber to uh, impose any sanction on the uh, defense counsel. I believe that uh, this is not in accordance with the uh, established uh, procedures of requesting for such a sanction. It is important that uh, the chamber uh, is provided with a sufficient ground to this uh, and 
the opportunity to examine the merit of this application. And as my international uh, colleague uh, has already uh, mentioned that what uh, was published in the uh, Phnom Penh Post was nothing new. It has something that we have already raised in, in the court. And in addition, the prosecutor uh, prosecution may uh, have uh, failed uh, to uh, look at uh, the uh, merit uh, of the substance of this uh, article, particularly uh, taking uh, the view from the defense counsel, uh, a person who is uh, representing the interests of the client. And I believe that uh, the any allegation that we are interfering in the administration of uh, justice is the uh, position that is misleading, and uh, and it is also a misrepresentation of the defense uh, position. And on the point that the lead co-lawyers uh, for the civil party raised both uh, the international and national lead co-lawyers uh, for the civil party who said that um, the civil party were disappointed with the uh, decision to remain silent on the side of Mr. Kilsampon. And as the chamber and all parties are well aware that uh, this tribunal is now bringing to trial um, Mr. Kiu Sampon uh, and other leaders, and the exercise of his right to remain silent of Mr. Kiu Sampon is his inherent right. The trust and confidence of Mr. Mr. Kiu Sampon on the impartiality of this court is uh, his uh, sole uh, decision. So I believe uh, that uh, the impact emanated uh, from uh, this court is of serious uh, consequence uh, for him. Eventually, he may be found uh, guilty if he failed uh, to follow the due process of international law. I believe uh, that uh, we are now not in a conference or we are not in a school where the researchers come to conduct research. It is the, a trial in a court of law. That's why uh, we have to look at every uh, reliable evidence and everyone has to have the trust and confidence in the process, particularly in the court. And uh, it all up to Mr. Kiu Sampon uh, to assess it along the way, and uh, as a result, uh, his cooperation with uh, this court. Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs>